Welcome to Proclaiming Justice, a podcast from PJTN that focuses the light of truth on vital issues in today's headlines that impact every American. I'm your host, Laurie Cardoza Moore, founder and president of Proclaiming Justice to the Nations, and I'm here to educate, motivate, and activate you to action. I want to arm you with the truth and the facts you'll need to fight and preserve our constitutional republic and uphold the Judeo-Christian values our nation was founded upon. Ladies and gentlemen, Laurie Cardoza Moore, and again, we're coming to you from the National Religious Broadcasters Convention. And I am so honored to have our next interview, Adele Raymer. Adele came from Israel. She was, um, she survived an attack by Hamas in her own home. And she is here to tell us this story. So we're so grateful, Adele, to have you. I just watched earlier the IDF footage, the video that they've compiled of all the images that they gathered from the cell phones, from the car cam, the cameras in cars, and even some of the 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 um, the Israelis that were killed before they were killed. They they captured some of the footage. And it's just, I'm still overwhelmed by what I saw, the images that I saw. But you have first-hand knowledge. Tell us about what happened to you on October 7th. So uh, October 7th for me actually began on October 6th when my kibbutz was celebrating um, our 77th anniversary where one of the kibbutzim that in 1946 went out into the desert at the request of David Ben-Gurion to have a Jewish presence in the Negev Desert so that when the country would be announced as proclaimed the state, right. we would have Jewish communities in the Negev Desert. So it's 11 of us, our communities that went out and did that. And we celebrated um, on Simchat Torah, the, the holiday at the end of the holiday, the high holy holiday season. Um, so we were having a wonderful celebration. We had lots of visitors, great atmosphere. And that night, my, my son was also visiting. I have a 33-year-old son who uh, lives in Tel Aviv and have a daughter who lives on kibbutz and has three children, three of my grandchildren also oh, live wow. on kibbutz. And so before I went to sleep on October 6th, I told him, if you wake up in the morning and note to me, don't be worried because I want to get up early before sunrise to go out into the fields and take pictures of the wildflowers, the squills. Luckily, I was too tired to get out of bed that morning because if I had actually done that, I would not oh be gosh. sitting here in Nashville talking to you today. So I stayed in bed and at 6.30, the incoming rocket warning started blaring. Now we live my kibbutz is a mile away from the border with the Gaza Strip, which means when there's incoming rockets, we have between zero to 10 seconds from the second you hear that alarm to the second you hear the explosion oh, wow. to get to someplace safe. So I immediately jumped out of bed, ran to the safe room, which is also my guest room. So my son was already there and it was a crazy heavy barrage that was one after another and it was of letting up and I was it was so heavy that I was scared to stand up to close the iron window that protects us from shrapnel oh my god so I was sitting on the floor just waiting for the rockets to stop and and I turned on the tv and I see that the uh, attacks are so widespread they're from the north of, of Tel Aviv to south of us uh, over a hundred miles it, it was like all over these attacks and it was only in retrospect that i realized that this was in order to camouflage to take attention away from the main event right. which was happening along the border in tens of spots a, a well organized planned collaborated attack on israel infiltrating the sovereign state of israel all at the same time they infiltrated over 20 communities, three cities, army bases, all at once. 
So at, at one point we got notification that um, Israel had been invaded because official information wasn't really coming through. Right. This was just from our internal messaging system in, in the kibbutz. And we were told to go outside of the safe rooms, to lock all doors and windows, to go back into the safe room and lock it. Oh, wow. But the safe room does not lock. Safe room was built to keep us safe from rockets. Oh, my gosh. And if it locks and something happens to you inside, first responders can get, get in to save you. Here. Oh, no. So we're in the safe room and all of a sudden, on the internal messaging system, we see people in the, or 450 in our community. So I know everybody and I know where they live. And we're seeing cries for help saying, we can hear gunfire. No, we, we know, I know what rockets exploding sound like. Right. I've never heard gunfire in the kibbutz and grenades exploding. And they said, and we can hear Arabic outside. And then we're seeing messages that we, that, our houses are being infiltrated. Oh no. And that houses are being set on fire. And I'm watching the progression of the terrorists through the WhatsApp group as they're getting closer and closer to where, where I live, to where my son-in-law lives. I knew that he was with my grandchildren to my daughter's house. And he just said, well, you can't do anything. At one point, my son, who understands a little bit Arabic, said that he heard them, we heard Arabic outside our house and he heard someone saying, come away from there. So he's sitting on the floor by the safe room door, holding down the handle so that if anybody infiltrates, hopefully he'll be strong enough to keep the door locked by pulling down the handle. And after about an hour, I went out of the safe room because I had to go to the bathroom where I was already in physical pain. I opened the door very quietly in case there were terrorists in the house. And I saw the window right opposite me, the slats had been broken. Mm. So the terrorists were literally on my porch, breaking into my house through my front window when they were called away. We don't know what caused that divine intervention or dumb luck or, or my husband watching over us, but we were left alone. At, unbeknownst to me at the same time, my son-in-law was one of the first responders but couldn't go out because my three young grandchildren, aged two, four, and two, six, and eight, were in the house with him. He separated from my daughter, so he was in the house all alone with the girls. And he heard them breaking into his house. He told the girls, hide yourselves under the blanket you're going to hear a loud noise. Do not come out no matter what. I'm here. It's okay. And he loaded his gun, pointed at the door. And when he saw the handle of the safe room door starting to move, he kicked open the door and shot the terrorist a yard away from the door. Oh my gosh. Thank God he was armed. My daughter was on her own in her house with the lights out, you know, we all turned off the air conditioning so there wouldn't be noise, giving away the fact that there were people hiding in there, hiding under her bed in the dark for hours. She was scared to go to the bathroom. She just did it all there on herself. We were that way for hours. The first troops came to the kibbutz at 1.30 in the afternoon. That's seven hours after the first alarm was began. So we're sitting in our rooms, seven hours, not knowing what's happening. We got no official no work from anybody, no communication. The only thing that we were told at one point, the army isn't coming. Each family has to take care of themselves. There was a family that whose house was set on fire, who had a 10-day-old baby. Hi. And the terrorists tried to enter their safe room. They didn't manage to open it, but they managed to dislodge the door. So when they set the house on fire, the smoke 
was yeah. streaming into the safe room with this 10 day old baby. Ah. They were on the phone, frantically calling for help, the fire department, the, the police, the army. Nobody could come and save them. They were on the phone with, with mother, with Magen David Adon, the, the people that are over there with the, in the exhibit there. And they, they were on the phone with them for hours, telling them what to do. They said, put the baby by the window, open the window a crack, leave him on the window sill a little bit, and then take him away and put him down. It was scary because there were terrorists outside. And they could have easily, if they'd noticed that they could have easily opened the window and gotten in. So when the first troops came at about 1.30, they knew about the situation. There was one corner of the kibbutz especially where the houses were burning. And they went there right away. They extricated that family. Baby Kai is safe mm -hmm. and the beautiful wow. healthy baby. Um, and they went house by house extricating people. They didn't come to my house until about 5.15. So we were in that safe room for 11 hours, just waiting, waiting for them to come to us, waiting for them to break into our house. You know what? There was one point that the, the tension, the fear was so strong that, that I, I was just saying, just come in already, just get it over with already. I was just waiting to be slaughtered or kidnapped. When, when, when the soldiers came at 515, they took us out of the house. They walked us to the community center where they kept the entire, they, they gathered all of the people from the kibbutz slowly but surely for 1.30 mm. till about 9 in the evening. They brought everybody over to the community house. It was extremely crowded. You couldn't even sit down, let alone lie down. So they took some of us to other structures that were rocket proof because all this time it was an active still going war zone. Out. Yes. There were still rockets coming in. There were terrorists. They're it's the kibbutz and around it, roaming, yes. murdering, shooting, slaughtering. So we spent the night that way. I I was freezing because I, I you know, I just left the house with my summer dress that I had on and and that was it. And so I found a tablecloth and covered myself with a tablecloth to try and keep warm and get a little rest. Finally, the next day at one o'clock, we were told that they believe they've gotten all of the terrorists in our kibbutz. Outside, of course, it was still full of terrorists outside of the kibbutz. They told us to go to our homes, to quickly pack a bag and to wait in the safe room for word to come out and get on buses or get in our cars so that we would be evacuated to a lot. That whole procedure was, was petrifying as well because it, it was chaos. They didn't have time to plan it properly. Right. So nobody knew who was going by car because so many people's cars were just destroyed. Right. No, it wasn't only the terrorists that came. There were t between 50 to 60 terrorists in our community. But after the wave of terrorists, they called people in Gaza and said, come on in. And it was oh just gosh. regular Gazans, regular Gazan citizens coming in, destroying, setting things alight with glee, with, with glee. So there were many people whose cars were not, were, were burnt, totally right. destroyed. So they didn't even know if they would be able to leave in their cars or not. So it wasn't an exodus that could be planned. I was on the bus for 40 minutes. I was so scared. It, it was even, it was as frightening as when I was in the safe room before I was taken out of the safe room because if there had been an incoming rocket, I wouldn't have been yeah, able no to get place. out. Yeah. So we were eventually evacuated. He will an active war zone with cars on the side on fire, charred bodies on the ground, tanks driving by, soldiers. It, it was, we still, we didn't break the easy until we got to Eilat. Um, we were in Eilat for about three months. We lost five people, five 
people were slaughtered on Nirim that day. Five people were taken hostage. Two of our hostages are still there. Nadav Popovel was kidnapped together with a 79-year-old mother. Yegev Bushtav was kidnapped with his wife. And another woman was kidnapped, who was a visitor. And that was 139 days ago. So for 139 days, these two, together with 132 other hostages, are still in the terror tunnels of Gaza. We don't know what their situation is. Nadav is diabetic. He's not getting his medicine. Nadav is a computer genius. Yagev is a musician. He makes music. He builds musical instruments. I've known them both since I came to Nirim. I know him from birth. He was about four when I came to, the, to live on Nirim. And we're not going to be able to start healing until we get our people back. Right. You know, ladies and gentlemen, this has been 139 days. And our administration, you all have heard we talk about Biden, where the Biden administration is hypocritical. One day they say that they're going to help Israel, and the next day they are pushing Israel to divide the land of Israel. One day Biden is saying, we're going to let Israel finish the job and do whatever Israel needs to do. They have our full backing, our full support, but we still have 139 days later, 134 hostages, ladies and gentlemen. Dead and alive. They're not Dead. alive, and we don't know if, how many are going to... Each day that goes by, there's less and less of a chance that we're going to get them back alive. I have personal friends there that are in their 70s and 80s who are sick. They have heart conditions. They're not getting their medication. And they've not been released. This can't, this can't continue. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to contact your state represent or your congressmen and your senators. And you need to let them know that we need these people released. There is going to be no stopping anymore until these people are returned home to their families. Some of them are American citizens. That's, that's correct. My Thank friend, you for reminding me. My friend Judy and her husband Gabi are American citizens. And there are more there as well. And what is our government doing to rescue Americans? This, you know, leadership matters and who we elect to serve matters. And Israel, we've told Israel that we have their back. Well, here we have Israelis, we have Americans, and I'm sure there are other nationalities there too. Well, why don't we have their back now? Adele, I am, I'm encouraged by your story, but I'm still, I'm still in shock by what I saw, the images that I saw. And to think that the world continues to put pressure on Israel and blame Israel for what's going on. You know, and they're not holding the Palestinians or Hamas accountable. What do they want to do? They want to give the Hamas a, pa a Palestinian state, a two-state solution. We want to reward them? No, ladies and gentlemen, that's unacceptable. We don't reward terrorists and we don't aid and abet terrorists, but we do with this administration. You know... The Jew, I grew up in America, and I grew up on the values of appreciating cultural diversity and protecting your minorities and looking after the people that need help. And, and I, I am just flabbergasted today that people do not understand that the Jewish people are an endangered minority. Yes, they are. We're in danger of extinction. And... Here and, and in Israel, even the anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is on the rise. It's out, absolutely out of control. And not just here in the United States, but we're seeing Europe. an explosion around the world. Adele, we're living in 2024. You would think we would be over this. We would have gotten past this. But we haven't. I'm so sorry. 
for the losses of the people in your community. I'm so sorry you had to endure what you endured. Thank you. Well, but, but I have to say, we, I'm, I'm optimistic. I'm going to be going back to my home. I don't know when, but I already have plans for renovating my house. We're not going to be able to go back until the IDF and the government of Israel do the, get the job done. Right. In order to get back there, I have to regain, I have to be given back the security, the confidence that I had on October 6th That's right. when I told my son That's right. that I was going out before dawn to take pictures in the fields. Until that happens, until I get that security back and until we get our people back, yeah. we're not going to be able to move on. Yeah. And we have to move on. Because if you give up on Nirim, you can give up on Israel. Adele, thank you so much for sharing the story. And I hope when you return home that you're going to tell your friends how much you were loved and appreciated and encouraged by what you saw here at the NRB. Thank you for elevating our voices and elevating the voices of those who had no longer at this point and speak for themselves. Thank you so much. You're in our prayers. I've gotten so much love since I've been here. I just, you know, I grew up here and did not feel that love from the Christian community when I was growing up. And, but I'm feeling it now and it's just so inspiring. Thank you again for joining me on this edition of Proclaiming Justice. Please share this podcast with your family and friends. For more information about how you can get involved, please visit our website at pjtn.org. As a PJTN Watchman, you can help us keep up the fight to preserve our freedom for our children and their children for such a time as this.